In the last video, we looked at introducing normal distributions and we talked about the area um, under a normal distribution curve a little bit with that 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Um, what we're gonna move on to in the next section here is what's called um, the standard normal distribution. So we're gonna learn about that um, and then we're gonna um, move on from there to, to finding more areas even even further in more detail than we learned in that empirical rule. So um, if we look here, it says that there are infinitely many of those normal distributions. Um, and we talked about that in the last video. Um, each one of those normal distributions, remember, is based on its unique mean and its unique standard deviation. Um, and so when trying to find probabilities of certain outcomes for a variable that we know is normally distributed, um, what we would have to do is we'd have to be able to find the corresponding area to its unique distribution function and that requires calculus and so um, in order to have a non-calculus based way of doing statistics we're going to look at this standard normal distribution um, where basically we are going to standardize every one of those infinitely many normal distributions um, into one standard normal distribution um, and then we'll be able to find areas under that curve. So again, while there were infinitely many normal distributions, there is one standard normal distribution. Um, we call that variable that, that has the standard normal distribution, we call it Z. And Z always has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So the mean of Z is always zero the standard deviation of z is always one. That means if we draw it, remember it's still a normal distribution, so it's gonna be that bell-shaped. It's symmetric about its mean, and remember its mean is always zero. And then we're going to do what we normally do, which is we typically label out to about three standard deviations above and below that mean. Standard deviation, remember, is one. So that's just one, two, three, and negative one, negative two, negative three. This axis now we're gonna label as the Z axis because it's our standard normal distribution. Okay, so we're gonna work a lot with standard normal distributions. Um, first thing here as we move into that, we're gonna look at a Z score, um, the formula for it, and then how to use it. So what we're told here is that if x, so we're back to x, x is a normally distributed variable. So maybe it's something like that head circumference of infants from the last example. Um, it's gonna have a mean and it's gonna have a standard deviation. These are referring to the mean and standard deviation of x, not of the standardized variable z yet, okay? What we're saying is we can find a z-score by taking our observed x value subtracting its mean and dividing by its standard deviation. So I have a couple properties here about the z-score. Um, a positive z-score is going to indicate that our observed value of x was greater than the mean. And you could see that happening because if x is bigger than the mean, then when we take x minus mu, we'll get a positive number. Um, standard deviation always has to be positive anyway. And then a negative z-score would mean that the value of x was less than the mean. So again, the only way to get a negative z-score is if x is smaller than mu, and then when we take x minus mu, we would get a negative number. That would mean our x value was less than the mean. So we're gonna look at that here with an example. Um, this example says that the heights of female college students are normally distributed with a population mean of 64.4 inches and standard deviation of 2.4 inches. So we're given the mean of X is 64.4 and the standard deviation of X is 2.4. And what we're asked to do here is find the Z-score that corresponds to a student who is 68 inches tall. So 68 inches tall is the particular value of x that we're interested in in this case. So we're looking at a student who is 68 inches tall and we wanna find that student's z-score. So we would follow the formula above. We take the observed x value of 68. 
we subtract the mean of 64.4. We divide by the standard deviation of 2.4. And so when we take 68 minus 64.4, we get 3.6. And our standard deviation was 2.4. Um, what this is telling us, if we really, I'm going to pause here a second before I go to finding Z. I want us to think about what this means. This numerator here, um, that's calculating how far away in inches, right? Each of those was in inches. How far away in inches was our particular observed student's height from the mean height? So at this point, these are both still in inches. But what happens when we divide numbers that have the same units, well, those units are going to cancel. And so we get down to 3.6 divided by 2.4. We get down to 1.5. And what I want to make sure that we understand at this point is that 1.5, the units on that are not inches. What we were looking at is how many of our standard deviations fit into that difference. So we took the difference between x and mu, and then we wanted to see, well, how many of those standard deviations does it take to get to the difference? So how many copies of 2.4 does it take to get to 3.6? That's what we're looking at. Um, 2.4 was, remember, the standard deviation. So that is the units on a z-score, is standard deviations. So what we're saying here is that a student who's 68 inches tall is one and a half standard deviations above average. And we know it's above because this was a positive z-score. Okay, um, let's do this again for a student who's 62 inches tall. So what changes is our observed x value. And we're gonna take 62 minus the mean is still 64.4. Standard deviation is still 2.4. And so 62 minus 64.4 gives us negative 2.4. So this student is 2.4 inches below the mean. And the standard deviation was 2.4, so that's exactly a negative one, which means that a student who is 62 inches tall is one standard deviation below the mean, below because we got a negative z-score. Okay, um, so we will, we will learn more about this later, but basically the idea here of, of converting our x variables into z is that it allows us to get a common um, way to compare values and compare whether values are extreme or unusual um, between different normal distributions. Okay, so the, the next thing that we're gonna move on to here is I wanna just make sure that we can see the relationship between a normal distribution x and the standard normal distribution z. Um, and so if we take a look here at this example, it says the length of human pregnancies is normally distributed with a mean of 266 days and a standard deviation of 16 days. Um, so again, at this point, we know the mean of x, where x is length of human pregnancy, the mean is 266, and the standard deviation is 16. So that's what we've read so far. We also know it's normally distributed. So um, shorthand, we could write it this way. Right, x is distributed normally with mean 266 and standard deviation 16. And this says, suppose we wanna find the proportion of pregnancies that last between 250 and 280 days. So we're asked to draw the normal distribution curve, shading the corresponding region. So we, again, we're looking at length of human pregnancy. 
we know that this is normally distributed because we were told that. We know it's centered at 266. And we know that if we label out, um, we would typically label three standard deviations to either side. Um, we're labeling this axis X because these are the original values of X, which are length of pregnancy. So the mean was 266. Um, we're gonna add increments of 16 as we go out here. So we would get to 282, 298, and 314. Again, this is length of pregnancy in days. Um, we would then, again from 266, we would subtract increments of 16, and that would get us to, let's see, 250, 234, and 218. Okay. So what this question is saying, well, is what if we wanted to find the proportion of pregnancies that last between 250 and 280 days? Well, 250 is right here, happens to be sitting right at um, the one standard deviation below mark. Um, and then 280 is right up here. And so what we're looking for is the area under the curve between those two values. And what we're gonna learn soon is how to actually find that area. And um, we can tell it's probably gonna be pretty close to 68% because this is almost one standard deviation to either side, um, but it wouldn't be right at 68%. So we'll learn in a, in a little bit how to find that area. Um, for now, all we're doing is trying to shade it Okay, so this value here would be at 250, and this one here is 280. Sorry, that's a little scrunched up down there. Um, if we repeat the process here, um, the next thing that we're doing in part B is drawing this standard normal distribution that corresponds to the normal distribution we just drew. So the standard normal distribution, um, still bell-shaped, but this time it's the standard normal distribution, which means it's Z. That means that it is gonna be centered at zero. And we're gonna label one, two, and three, and then negative one, negative two, and negative three. This is now our Z axis, not our X axis. Um, and what we wanna do to figure out what areas we would shade on the standard normal distribution is we would convert each of our x values. So we had one x value up here of 250, and we had another one at 280, and we would convert each of those into a z-score. So our first z-score is going to be, um, just as a reminder, here's the z-score formula. So our observed value of x is 250, our mean is 266, our standard deviation is 16, and we get negative 16 over 16, which is negative one. And we saw that here, right? 250 was exactly one standard deviation below the mean. So that's one of our Z values. And then the other one is gonna be when X was 280, So that's 14 over 16, which is 0.875. So that's our other Z value. And so negative one here, 0.875 up here. and we would shade that area. And so the, the important part here that I want us to see visually is that the area 
underneath the original distribution curve is going to be proportional to the area underneath the standard normal distribution curve. Um, and that's why this process works of converting x values into z scores um, is that it allows us to take any variable x, convert it to z, and we can still find um, the proportion or percentage of area under the curve, which corresponds to the proportion of observed values within that interval. Okay, um, and so that's what we'll be moving on to next.